God bless the work of our children's workers. Thanks to those of you who serve in this, in this way for our church. It's a blessing. <clears throat> John chapter 10. Uh, as we turn there, I'm, again, it's kind of maybe a rhetorical question, but uh, are you ready to uh, open your Bible today? I have a lot of verses that just uh, came to bear upon the passage we're going to look at, and I'm looking forward to sharing them with you. And again, my desire is that you be equipped, that you know your word, of, that you know the word, that you're, you're able to process it faithfully as you go through your week. Uh, this is not just to uh, become more knowledgeable in just the academic sense, but knowledgeable in wisdom to grow up and to be able to understand these truths and allow them to impact our lives. I want to remind you also as to the reason why John wrote his gospel. He tells us point blank, all right? It's at the end of the gospel. It shows up in chapter 20, but in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, these things have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that by through this belief, you might have life in his name. That's why he wrote this gospel. And uh, may that continue to be true of us as we, as we move through this, again, this passage today in John 10. To review just briefly as to where we've been for the last uh, couple of weeks as we've been in, in this chapter, is uh, I would be able to say that Jesus is good in a manner like no one else. Where he's called the good shepherd. And we know that, and we hear that, and uh, we say, well, are other people good? Well, other people can be good. There are other good shepherds that take care of sheep, but Jesus is good in a way that no one else can match. And that's what we're considering today. We, we understood, first of all, that he was good in his person, who he is as the person, Jesus. Well, he's God. How good is God? So whatever God would do, he would be good at that also, and he is the good shepherd. It's the person that Jesus is as God himself. And secondly, he's good in the works that he does. The things that he says, well, let me show you my goodness. Let me demonstrate that for you. And we're considering now four examples to his works of being good. Last week, we covered the first of these. It was powerful. He lays down his life. Verses 11 to 13, may I read, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Tragic. Tragic circumstance. And in doing this, we came to understand that, uh, that Jesus is good. He's not a hired hand. He lays down his life for the sheep. This is something he did knowingly. It was planned. It was chosen by him. He wasn't forced into this. He wasn't tricked into, oh, what? what? No, total, total understanding, total desire to lay down his life for the sheep. Hired hands, false shepherds. In the contrast we've been seeing in this passage that he's contrasting himself, Jesus, from those Pharisees, the blind Pharisees who just will not process the, the word coming at them. So that's what we looked at last week, the lays down his life. Today, I'd like to move on to the other three. And uh, the second work of Jesus producing and our understanding of him being a good shepherd is that he knows his sheep. He knows his sheep. Now, there was a touch on this a little bit, but we're going to see an expansion here from what was said in John in this chapter, verses 3 and 4. But let me read verses, as it says here, verses 14 and 15. It says, I am the good shepherd. He states it again. Well, how are you the good shepherd? He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me. And I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Wow. This is a little bit more as far as this knowledge about them knowing each other, the shepherd and the sheep. We talked about the voice that they know, and he offers his voice, and they follow it. It's a little bit more than that, that they just know his voice. There's a relationship here. As beautiful and as wonderful as that voice, to know the voice of, of the shepherd is, there's something more that is implied here in verses 14 and 15. And the phrase that brings this out is the phrase, just as the Father knows me. <laughs> I know my sheep just as the Father knows me. If you think about that for a little bit, it, it should cause you, again, to marvel, to be so incredibly 
humbled at the grace that God bestows toward us in that he knows us just as the Father knows me. Jesus is comparing our relationship to his relationship with the Father. Our relationship to Jesus is compared to his relationship to the Father. There's a word in the Greek language that, that this was, was written in. The Greek word is ginosko. Ginosko. Not a Greek scholar. I'm not. But I can read the commentaries and figure this out. And what this word is implying is to know completely. It is to know intimately. It is to understand deeply, to have a total understanding of a person to person. It's ginosko. It is an idiom, the word of this, this term, is an, intimacy, is an idiom for sexual intimacy. That's how close the knowledge is at, a, at an intimate level. That word is used in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is speaking of Joseph and Mary. And he, ginosko, that's an idiom for sexual intimacy. That's the, the depth of this word. And what I read from that, what I, I can therefore approach from that is, I, I, and you, we're not nameless numbers in the grand scheme of the human condition. Just a number, just a number, next number, pull a number. Uh, does anyone even know that I'm still holding this number? Or, or have they forgotten about me? We, we are not nameless numbers. Where other shepherds, because Jesus is the good shepherd, where other shepherds, and this is not a fault of theirs, it's just a limitation of theirs, because we are all called to be shepherds, and sometimes we don't shepherd, and we don't know our sheep in this manner, but that's not necessarily a problem. We're trying our best at times, but where others, shepherds, may see a flock, like, like a sea of people, Jesus sees a sea of individuals, every single one and knows them intimately. He knows you intimately. He knows you, he compared it to how he knows the Father. That relationship. This is a knowledge, this is a, an affection that is so deep, so profound, that the comparison is, is to the Father. That's how much he loves us. And I'm thinking about that. Could he even compare that to some other things? Well, I guess he could have. He said, I know you like I know, and he could have, Put some, like the way I know angels. And that would have been impressive because I, I don't know about that. And I'd say, wow, you know us like you know angels? Could have, could have said that. I know you the way I know the Apostle Paul. I know you the way I know Peter and James and John, those three of the 12 that were kind of, I had a special connection to. I know you the way I know them. And I would have gone, wow, I'm into that little inner circle, as are you. He knows us the way, I know you the way I know them. Impressive, but it's not like that. It's beyond that. He knows us, he claims to know us the way in which I know the Father. Now. That is so marvelous, so incredible, that we are fair to ask, almost like, can you prove that? I mean, I, I don't, wow. And we're almost caught off guard by the depth of that intimate knowledge. So can, can you prove this? Can you prove your love for me, God, Jesus, Jesus here? Can you prove your love? Because we prove our love for each other at times, right? Jesus, prove it by teaching me how to play the piano, some of us might say. Or, or prove it by, I want to have a catch. I want to play catch. Do you want to play catch with me? Because we, I, I remember doing that as a father. My son said, you want to play catch? Yes. And that shows my love for him, that whatever I was doing is, no, I want to play catch with you. I love you, right? Can, can you buy me a, a new, new pair of shoes? Can you buy me some new jewelry? Can you take me here? Can you do this? I mean, there's, oh yeah, I love you, I love you. Let me show you how I love you. These aren't necessarily negative things at all. They're, they're positive, they're good. We should be able to give good gifts. So how, how does Jesus prove this incredible claim? Well, he tells us, verse 15, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
that's the proof. Glorious. You see, he is only, at this point, when this is being spoken of, he is only a few months away. We're in the third year. We are a few months away, and John is going to take us right to it, a few months away from his crucifixion. And he's going to lay down his life for the sheep. He's going to prove it. Romans 5, verses 7 and 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, he didn't even wait for you to get good or gooder or better. A little bit more, can can you come a little bit toward me? Because I'm going to die for you. Can you you show your worth a little bit? No. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Can we demonstrate this intimacy? Because apparently there's a relationship being involved there, that he knows us and, and, and we claim to know him. We claim to be in that relationship too. What could we do that would demonstrate a little bit of our desire to have that depth of intimacy? Because we can't die for God. So what could we do? What, what, what could show some of that? So making it, in a sense, a, a two-way street instead of just a one-way street. How about 1 Corinthians For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all. Now, whenever you see the word that, that gives you the reasons. That's a a word of, of, of transition to the reason as to why he died. That those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. What could I do to demonstrate a two way street? that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him. I could be done right now. We could just sit here for 25 more, 35 more minutes. You just contemplate that thought. How'd that go for you this week? How did your living for him go this week? I know we live for ourselves. I do as well. I mean, I live in a world. I have to do stuff. But did it also cross through my mind that I I need to live for him who died for me to show that intimate relationship? And even if if I did that, was it maybe uncomfortable? I only did it so far. Ah, I got uncomfortable. I'm going to hold off right there. Or did we just keep going in our love for him who died for us? 1 Corinthians 6, a few verses later, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. Price? The blood of Jesus. So glorify God in your body. As life comes at us, we are encouraged to consider how to be loving, obedient sheep. As life comes at you. And it comes at you from all different angles, all different ways, all different formulas coming to you. But live as a loving sheep. Not for yourself, but for him who died for you whatever that calling on your life might be. So he has proven this. He has shown this to us. And there's a, there's a third thing that he shows us by his work, that he is the good shepherd. And that's found in verse 16, where we have this idea. He brings other sheep to the fold. Other sheep, implying, well, I've got this fold. And we talked about that at the beginning of this chapter, that that was he's pulling sheep out of Judaism, That was the sheepfold that is originally referenced here. But now he tells us, I've got other sheep. Verse 16, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. (laughs) Is this a good shepherd? He doesn't just care for his own flock. He cares for other shepherds' flocks. And he brings them too. He takes care of them. He is very good. He he cares for those sheep that are in the folds of those false shepherds. And we've considered the false shepherds. And he's going to their folds and saying, come, hear my voice. And they're being called. These other sheep, verse 16, this other sheep term, is again, those other than the Jewish Israel fold. 
those who are in that fold of, of the Jewish religion. It's another sheepfold that he's calling them out. And the, 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 the term was clearly then, in one way of dividing the world at that time, I guess even today, would be those who are of Jewish blood, Jewish ancestry, and everybody else, right? You can do that in all kinds of ways, right? So they're Jews, and the scriptures talk about Gentiles. And that's who the other sheep are in. That's who the other sheep are, is the Gentiles. Not those in this fold. I already know about those, but I'm going to this over here, the, to the Gentiles. And this truth is being shared directly to, I mean, he's talking to a group of people, right? He's talking to the blind Pharisees. He's talking right to them and saying, I'm coming for your sheep. Because you're being false shepherds. You're not showing them. They're not, you're not guiding them and leading them toward God himself. So I'm going to come and get your sheep to show how great of a shepherd God is, how good he is, how, good, how great is love. If you'll uh, th allow me just to read some scripture with you, okay? I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. It's the next book, John, then Acts, right? Just a few pages, Acts chapter 2. We see the, be, the, the continuing, I mean, really the, the, the speed up, the ramping up of this Jesus calling sheep out of the Jewish fold, okay? We're not to the other sheep just yet. But notice the progression here. Jesus has been calling, he is calling out of the Jewish fold. And here in Acts chapter 2, the death has occurred, the resurrection has occurred, the ascension has occurred, the exaltation of Jesus before the Father has occurred, and the disciples that were left were told, wait. Wait for a while, and you're going to be imbued, imbued with power. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon them. In Acts chapter 2, we have the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's called Pentecost. And as you come to this, I, I want to show you uh, that Peter begins to teach a sermon to the gathered Jews from around the Mediterranean world at that time. They have come back to Jerusalem, to Pentecost, for that feast, and he is now teaching them. It's a powerful sermon. It goes on for quite a bit. But let me just read with you the conclusion of the sermon. And I want you to see in here how Jesus is, Jesus is calling out from his fold, the Jewish fold. Start with me at verse 36. Peter is talking, saying, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And that's end of that now here's luke giving commentary on what happened next 37 now when they heard this they were cut to the heart and said to peter and the rest of the apostles brothers what shall we do and peter said to them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the holy spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are fall off everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Get out of that false shepherd sheepfold, is what he's saying right there. Get out, come to Jesus. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls coming out of that Jewish sheepfold into the church, into right relationship with Jesus through his death and resurrection well that's what's going on with israel and then as you continue on through acts you know the book of acts is actually called the acts of the apostles and it's a history of the first several decades of the christian faith of the christian church first generation every one of them all right some of us can point to our christian heritage going back three four five eight generations and more this group of people first generation they're all the first christians and we have a story, an accounting of, of what was going on there, how God was doing this. So turn with me also to Acts chapter 10, and the plan of God is being uh, put on display here. I like to read a portion of Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 1, okay? So you have to turn there. I, I, a lot of verses. Here we go. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. Now, you know that immediately to not, not be a Jew. He's a centurion. He's, he's a Gentile, right? of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the poor, and prayed continually to God. Not a God, not some God, but God himself. A Gentile knows God. Not the first one. 
It's been happening all through the pages. If you just look for it, you'll see that Gentiles have always been calling out to God. Here's another one. Later on, we'll come to one in Acts 16 named Lydia. All right, and there are others, but let's continue here. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means. Now there's a, that's a very emphatic phrase in, in the language of what that's written. We just, by no means. As emphatic as you want to say, he's backing away from this concept. Okay? Lord, I, I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice came to him a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. God is communicating something to Peter. And he goes on and has how this arrangement, this, this meeting takes place between Peter and Cornelius, this Gentile centurion. And Peter becomes convinced that this is what God has for him to do, is to allow his mind to be blown that God is the God of the Gentiles too. Re skip ahead to verse 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago about this hour I was praying in my house at the ninth hour and behold a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send, therefore send to Joppa and ask for Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon of a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And Peter gets it. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Skip forward to verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had, be, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. There are sheep not in his current fold that he has to go bring in. How do we know that Jesus is the good shepherd? Because he brings in those sheep. This is glorious. It goes on from there. If you want to read the, into the Gentile world, in Acts 9, Paul has already been called and we then learned from chapter 13 of Acts to the end of Acts, this whole concept of God going to uh, Paul and the, the, the workings of God in the Gentile world. And the book of Acts changes from a Jewish history to a Gentile history of what God has done. And this is glorious because I'm one of those. I'm one of those other folded sheep. I was in the Dutch fold, I guess. Which fold were you in? I don't know how many of you have a Jewish heritage would say your lineage through your mother is Jewish. So we're, we're the other folds. And here we are today. A worldwide church, several centers of, uh, uh, have been this, several places have been the center of the Christian church. Not just one place, not just one particular fold, but this religion, our religion, started in Jerusalem. That was its center. Then a little bit of time, it became, Europe became its center. And a little bit of time later, a little, a lot of time later, it, apparently North, North America became kind of its center. But a little after that, it became Africa. And a little after that, you know where the center of the Christian faith, where most Christians are being birthed today is? Asia. China. Today. The Christian church, the Christian faith is all around the world because there are other sheep that Jesus has to bring in. 
And I'm so encouraged by this other phrase in Acts chapter, excuse me, in, in John 10, verse 16, where he says, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. They will listen. They will listen. I'm encouraged by that. I was down at Mexico Caravan, you know, this weekend, yesterday, and we were in that room where you saw a gathering room, all on every wall, missionary statements and hope and challenge and prayer and maps and countries' names all, all around it. And they will listen. And they will come to the Savior. Of course. And why? Because they know the voice. The voice that was true of the Jews, it's the same voice that's true for these Gentiles who are being called as well. I'd like to have you turn again with me to Acts chapter 18. Let me read a few verses there in Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 5. Starting at verse 5. Notice, notice the transition here even. That if the Jews won't listen, well, we're going to the Gentiles then. Acts 18, verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Remember, Christ means Messiah, means the expected one. And what Paul is saying in Corinth, in the Jewish synagogue, Jesus is the Christ. The Christ is Jesus. Again, what? And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. There it is again. Not a God, a worshiper of Yahweh God, a Gentile. Notice what it says. His house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> Isn't that cool? How did he become a worshiper of God? Well, in some manner, the worshiping that had been going on there, he was curious, he checked it out, and, and he compared what he thought he was coming out of this understanding of this people's religion to what he was raised up. And he goes, I don't think what I've been taught, or I think there might be something to this God. I've heard of this God now. And his house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. Notice he's the ruler of the synagogue, but he still couldn't convince the Jewish people in the synagogue that he was a ruler of to accept the Christ. It, it was him. He came to it. He understood, but others did not. Together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people." And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among the other Gentile fold. Beautiful. And a church was born. This is Corinth. A church is born. They will listen. So again, remember that we have a treasure. And we're called to share it. We're called to involve ourselves with it. I read a study uh, this week that says that 43% of people who are Christian who are believers in Jesus, came to that faith before they were a teenager. You saw all those children walking out, our children's ministry, our neighborhood connect ministry, what we're going to be doing and planning this summer. We're targeting children because 43% of people who are Christian come to that before they're a teenager. And then there's another 21% who come to faith as a teenager. Are you praying for Aaron? Are you praying for our impact? It's the name of our youth group. Do you pray God's power be evidenced as Aaron teaches the word? Maria, thanks for serving alongside him. And we're doing this, right? We're not, oh, he's got the youth mindless of, of this because we're living. Lord, what would you have me do? Pray for our children's ministry. Pray for our youth ministry. God's kids, flight. Jeff and Cece, thanks for serving so faithfully in flight. Fourth through sixth graders. Do you want to do it? You don't, don't worry. We've got a couple who loves to do that, ministering faithfully for that. So, but you're praying for them, right? 
our missions, all that we're doing in our missions, it, it, this is, this is, there's, there's a voice that is to be heard, and we're to involve ourselves with that. This is how good God is. He has another pen, other sheep, and he's bringing them in. A fourth thing that shows how good God is. Our fourth thing is that he takes his life up again. Verses 17 to 18, let me read. Let me get there first. <clears throat> John 10, 17. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. How is he a good shepherd? Well, because he, he takes his life up again. God has prepared his sheep to believe that phrase. Because it's, 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 again, it's another one of those mind benders. How in the world is it? What, what did you just say? What do you mean when you say that you will lay down your life and take your life up again? That is clearly a reference to the resurrection. And for us to, you and I, to believe that, that was the work of God. That was the grace of God. I talk with people who don't believe that that happened. So why would then they believe the other things about the cross and the claims of Jesus? They don't believe the resurrection. But you're going, well, they don't? Because it, it just clicks with you, right? Because God's grace prepared you to believe that when the voice was given to you. You processed that and accepted that, and it became true for you. Then again, no other sheep is this, no other shepherd is this good to his sheep. No other shepherd would even request that someone have such faith to believe in the resurrection. Does anyone else ever say this? Again, he makes the statement, the Father loves me. The Father loves me. And again, this isn't an earned thing. This has always been true. John 17, we'll study this in the future, I guess, but John 17, verse 24 Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory. Do you see it right now? You don't. This is a something toward the future. Jesus is praying right here, and that he is praying that they will see my glory where I am, that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus never earned the Father's love, and you don't have to either. Remember that relationship? It's the same just as the Father and Jesus, that... You don't have to earn Jesus, the Father's love. When you were a sinner, Jesus died for you. And then Jesus expresses this by obediently going to the cross. But in going to the cross, he says in verse 17, I lay, my I lay down that I may take it back up. And again, resurrection. There are a lot of reasons for Jesus' death. Admittedly so. There's a ransom that got paid there is the act of paying it, which is redemption. The, the death of Jesus accomplished those theological things. The payment for our sin was done. But there's another reason that he just told us as to why he had to die. He died so that he could overcome death. You can't overcome, uh, prove that you can overcome death. The only way to do that is to die first. And then if you can overcome death, well, okay, well, you did that too. So the death was sufficient for a lot of things. Right? But it also proved that death couldn't hold him. It proved that he is resurrected. These two are linked. The dying and the rising are linked together. That's the plan. And again, this is a, this is a, a mind-boggling statement. What was the reaction? Again, this isn't the only time that Jesus said such a phrase. He's applied, uh, uh, implied it elsewhere as well. But what a mind-boggling statement. Have you ever said such a thing? I will rise up myself. Now, you're talking about getting off the couch. I, I get that. I'm talking about, Jesus is talking about, I'm going to die. I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to die. And I am going to raise my life up again. This is amazing. Again, to, to predict one's death, I'm going to die. No miracle in that. I think I'm going to die. In fact, I predict I will die. Self-fulfilling Paul's prophecy, right? I mean, of course, that's obviously true. People die. But he said, I'm going to rise also by my, by my power. I will take it up again. Can you even consider that? And again, as he says this, this is a repeated prophecy. I got um, several places where this is in the other Gospels where Jesus makes similar reference to what he just said right here. 
But that, you can look those up later if you like, but it's a repeated prophecy. Jesus is telling the masses, I'm going to lay my life down, and I'm going to rise it up again. And the fact of this is that his credibility rests on this one sign. Because if this doesn't happen, then it was all a lie. It was just boastful talk that could not be backed up. And we, we say things from time to time, and we think we can back them up. We usually can. But do you realize how significant this is? He has to back up that he will rise again. And if he doesn't, everything else just is, is clouded by that falsehood and therefore is questionable. And in fact, as Corinthians tells us, if he didn't rise from the dead, it's all a joke. Christianity is just another moral teaching to help you get through your way in this world and get along with people and it goes well for you. And you're a nice guy and you're a nice gal in the community and everyone likes you, I guess. If he didn't rise from the dead, it's just another system. But the fact that he did, this changed everything. This is true. I lay it down voluntarily, by choice, on purpose, and it is proved that that is a voluntary action by him saying, I lay it down and I take it up again. I'm choosing this. I'm in control. You want to see how much in control he is of this whole concept? Look at verse 18. He says, no one takes it from me. No one takes it from me. That concept cannot be overemphasized. There are those who have a total misconception of what Jesus was doing, of what his whole life was. He was a great guy, good teacher, moral man. What an example. And he died for all of that. We covered that a little bit last week. No. No, it was purposeful. And no one takes it from him. There's a little back and forth. Remember John 19? Again, we'll get there later. It's, it's identified here. So Pilate said to him, this is when he's before him with the power of life and death, obviously. Pilate says, you will not speak to me? So he was given a question, and Jesus stayed silent. You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Don't you know who I am, what I can do, what I control over you? You remember Jesus' answer, don't you? <laughs> Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. You don't have authority over me. I have authority over me. I'm going to lay my life down. Uh, let's, let's go. Let's get it done. I'm not fighting. Like a lamb before the shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth when he was questioned. He gave an answer, but he, no, I'm not defending myself. I'm not saying, oh, mercy, mercy, please. No, his point was to lay down his life. Jesus is saying, I'm calling the shots here. I'm orchestrating this. It's my Father's will, and I'm, pulling, I'm, I'm carrying it out to, to perfection as we come to my death. You see, the, the scriptures are clear because it's happened elsewhere at other times that Jesus could have walked out. Even there, at that, in, before Pilate, he could have walked out and they wouldn't have been able to lay a hand on him. He could have, as the phrase is, passed through. I remember this verse after I put together our PowerPoint, but Luke 4, uh, just as an example of this, but in Luke 4, verse 28 to 30, is just one of the accounts of this happening. Luke chapter 4, Verse 28, when they heard these things, Jesus had said some things, and he's saying some things about Gentiles, and the Jewish people go, oh. anyway, when he, they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up and drove him out of the town. So this is actually happening, and they brought him to throw him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, this is Nazareth, and so that they could throw him down the cliff. Whoa. Whoa. But passing through their midst, he went away. How do you do that? I mean, they, they got him from the synagogue all the way through town or out in the, and now we're at the, and then he just turned around and walked through their midst. He could have done it any time he wanted to. But again, he's orchestrating his death, and it's going to happen on a particular time, in a particular place, to fulfill all the prophecies. And that's what he will do. And death was, in this sense, 
It was desired by Jesus, and it was controlled by Jesus to the very end. Sometimes we think of crucifixion, we imagine what that might be for a man to hang on a cross, and the torture that it was, and the, the, just the degradation of the body, and the, 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 the physical abuse, and the suffocation is what it actually produced most commonly, was suffocation. And you can imagine the, this, this visual of fighting for the very last breath, and just fighting, fighting, fighting. The will to live is so strong in mankind. And typically, the last breath would be taken with, you know, just agony. And just, uh, I, I, I can't do any more. And, and then death. Not our Lord. Have you read that last moment of his life? It's in all four of the Gospels. Said in these ways in all four of the Gospels. But notice, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He cried out in a loud voice. It's almost as if I still got the strength, I still have it, and I'm crying with a loud voice. And goes on. That was Matthew, Mark, and Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Luke, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Exclamation point. Maybe I could, I, I know I'm being amplified right now, but I could maybe cry that out in a loud voice. You want me to? How loud that would be? And having said this, he breathed his last. He breathed his last. He chose... And that's it. And breathed his last. He just decided, I'm done now. I am now going to say, I'm going to die. In our Gospel of John, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It wasn't taken from him. He gave up his spirit. It's, it's done. I, I'm finished. I completed it. This is total control. Total control of one's own death in power, in strength, in confidence, knowing that he has paid the price and now he is going to be free of that pain. His, he'll be done with his physical body. This is so amazing that there was a, 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 a witness at the cross. And Matthew records what this guy said. The Roman centurion, the executioner, his executioner, responsible to watch it all play out, right? His executioner said, when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. The earthquake's amazing, but the other things that took place, this guy died like no one they'd ever seen. He died in power, conviction, purpose, desired it for you. the good shepherd, the very unique shepherd, unlike anyone else ever. You would think, having heard this and even later on, but as to how this, what, what's going to happen with this, well, what is the result of this dialogue? Because we, we, in a sense, come to this little change of gears here. We're, we're kind of done with this. It's going to continue on later, another dialogue as the chapter continues. But this dialogue is kind of done. We've had the whole the light of the world discourse. We've had the black, back and forth with, the, with the, the blind man. We've had the back and forth here with the shepherding here. What's the result of all of this? Verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? The dialogue's result is that, again, there's a division among the Jews. And again, the Jews there, a division among the Jews. Jews is the, the leaders, not necessarily all the people, but the leaders. That's the term that John uses for the Pharisees, the false shepherds. And there's division among them. Again, <laughs> not the first time, but again, God is working. God is working. There's a division. It's not like they're all on one side, the negative side. They're not all there. There's a division Something is going on. Jesus has said things. Jesus has done things. Jesus has taught things. And now there's this logic. Their, their hearts are being changed. Are they starting to hear the voice, some of them? I think so. Again, I shared, the, again, the verse with you last week as far as, and a great many of the high priests, a great many of the priests came to faith in Jesus. Well, when is that cracking starting to happen? When is the, the voice starting to, to resonate and get in? All through this time, and here it is again, but there are some who say, no, he has a demon. 
These are his opponents. They are continually blind. This is not the first time that they've said this. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, chapter 8, twice, we've already studied how they said he has a demon. They've attributed the work of Jesus to a demonic activity. And this is said, I don't like this one word there in verse 20, many of them, many of them. I, I assume that's the majority. Uh, it doesn't give me a percentage there, but because the next word is others said, so many, but then others. I, I, I guess it's the majority. It doesn't give me an exact opportunity to say that con, uh, without any you know, consideration of, of it being the other way, but um, these individuals, these opponents have ignored the evidence. Jesus is pouring out to them. They've ignored evidence. They've ignored wisdom. They've ignored the logic. They've ignored the prophecies, which this next group doesn't do. Remember when we talked about the blind man, how that was pro prophesied as a messianic prophecy? This is something that they just can't get, their, get around to say he's not who he says he is because they know the prophecy. And that's what they say in verse 21. Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And again, it's that phrase, that prophetic messianic idea that they're going, ah, and they're stuck. He's a healer of the blind. He's very impressive in his words and in his deeds. And this group, hopeful. They're open. They're still able to be taught. And they're, they're, they're going to hear these things about take, laying my life down and taking it up again. And when that taking up occurs, and at this point, again, we're, we're still months away from the crucifixion and then, a, 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 then the three days after that, but when that event occurs, it, again, their minds are starting to get, whoa. I'm wondering if Nicodemus is in this crowd of the Pharisees. Remember, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea, Pharisee. When the body is to be taken off the cross, Joseph of Arimathea says, my, my, my tomb. And Nicodemus helps him. I'm thinking they're in this others. They're the ones that, whose minds are going, that, that can't be done by a blind man. That's a messianic thing. The soil is being prepared by Jesus himself. So how about you? Do you know the good shepherd? Do you know his voice? Have you heard it? He died for your sins. If you'd like to talk to me about that, I'd be thrilled. You want to talk right here now? That'd be great. You'd fill out a green card. We'll have a conversation. We'll have a talk. We'll come in. Um, that'd be great. I'd love to talk with anybody about this because uh, I want you to know the good shepherd in all of his glory. Can you pray with me, please? Father, we thank you for this day, the opportunity to gather again together as believers. You have truly been good to us to allow us to know one another, encourage one another thank you for this church i pray for your voice that it would continue to go out amongst the gentiles there are many of them father and you're calling them and i pray that you use this church to be instrumental in providing a voice into the gentile world that you would help us to live sacrificially and uncomfortably as we see the nations coming to know you pray you would continue to do your great work of drawing people unto yourself. For the glory of Christ we pray. Amen.